Welcome to USA Football's Coach and Coordinator Podcast, where top football coaches from around the country share their stories, philosophies, concepts, and strategies to help you get better on and off the field. Now, here's your host, Keith Grabowski. On today's podcast, I'm excited to be joined by one of the winningest active coaches in high school football, the head football coach at Highland Park High School in Dallas, Texas, Coach Randy Allen. Randy, it's great to have you here on the podcast. Thank you, Keith. Uh, it's an honor to talk to you. Coach, uh, so far, it's been uh, an amazing career for you. 403 wins, 89 losses, six ties, four state championships, uh, highly regarded around the country. I, I, I've known of you a long time before I bumped into you. I think we were at uh, the Texas High School Coaches Association years ago, and I was excited to bump into you there, and certainly uh, honored to be able to have you on our podcast to talk about things here. But uh, before we get all the way to 403 and, and stuff that's happening right now, I would love to hear about your start in coaching and what it was that spurred you on to get into coaching football. I was... Uh... Born into a family when my dad was an athlete. My mother was a high school cheerleader when she was in school. And so my dad coached me in Little League Baseball, and uh, I played whatever sport was in season. And when I was 12 years old, I was in Abilene, Texas, and Grant Taft was the head coach at McMurray University. And uh, I just saw where Coach Taft, things that I love to do, his faith and competitive athletics. And uh, my coaches had such a positive and, and powerful impact on me. I wanted to have that same type of impact on young men. And my senior year at Abilene Cooper High School, we got beat in the state championship game 20 to 19 on the last play of the game. So when I went to Southern Methodist University on a football scholarship, I wanted to be a football coach in high school. And I got my degree in social studies, and so I had a teaching certification. And then uh, my old high school coach, Mel Green, gave me my first uh, high school job as a varsity assistant football coach and head baseball coach. And uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful career. I never doubted my decision to be a, a high school football coach. I never wanted to be a college coach. Uh, I just love the impact that the high school coaches can have on their players. Coach, as you were getting into this and starting your experience as a coach, who were some of your mentors or who were the guys who really impacted the way uh, you started to develop as a football coach? I think it's really important to have uh, mentors and role models. And uh, I, of course, Coach Green, Merrill Green, my high school coach, was my biggest role model. And he had played at the University of Oklahoma for Bud Wilkinson, been a college coach, and then went from Texas Tech to be the head coach at Abilene Cooper. And he was the one that advised me about what to major in in college and how to get into high school coaching. But at that time in my life, Tom Landry was the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys and Coach Coach Landry, I'd hear him speak. Uh, at the Fellowship of Christian Athletes Summer Conferences and uh, had a great deal of uh, respect for him as a man and as a Christian and loved the way that he showed no emotion on the sidelines and seemed to be very uh, uh, ahead of the game as far as his offensive and defensive football. Uh, Grant Taft, of course, was a big influence uh, Tom Osborne, Bobby Bowden, those are all men that were Fellowship of Christian Athletes speakers. And uh, when I would go to summer conferences, those are the men that I, I listened to and learned from and uh, were, were my role models. I, I think I've heard this story before, Tom Landry being a big influence on you, you being um, from that area and coaching in Dallas now. <laughs> the suit on the sideline in, in, in the, the fedora hat, that's – that's a Tom Landry influence, of course. Well, the story goes that uh, his grandchildren graduated from Holland Park High School, and I think his wife might have gone to Holland Park. Uh, and so the year after Coach Landry uh, died, I wore a fedora from the first game to the last game of the season in his honor. I wore a suit and tie, just like Coach Landry did on the sidelines. 
And uh, so after that one year, I didn't know if I'd do it again. Uh, I thought that was had served its purpose. I'd honored Coach Landry. And so uh, the second year, the year after that, uh, we played a team that we were highly favored to win or to defeat. And uh, we got upset in the game. So at the Booster Club meeting that next Monday night, every, all the parents had their reasons why we got beat. You know, the grass was too high, the field was wet, we missed a field goal. And so I had a box with me, and I said, no, the reason we got beat is I didn't wear my fedora. So I opened the box, and my fedora was in the box, and I put it on it. So I wore it for the rest of that that season, and we went on about a 13-game winning streak after that, and I've worn it ever since. And uh, it's been, you know, in honor of Coach Landry, you go to AT&T Stadium, and even the Turnpike has a picture of his fedora, and, of course, he's got a statue there at AT AT&T Stadium, and uh, you know, he has still has a big impact, just uh, the memory of Coach Landry and the kind of man he was. Yeah, Coach, I've also heard some stories that you're you're a bit of a, a performer yourself, that, that over the years you've been known to do, you know, whether it's card tricks or uh, an Elvis impersonation, that uh, you're not necessarily somebody who's shy and getting up in front of people and performing. Yes, that's uh, – <laughs> it's harder and harder as I uh, – get older to be creative and think of new things but it it started out with Lou Holtz and Lou Holtz uh, on the Johnny Carson show did a paper tear and restoration trick and uh, so I told my wife when I get my first head coaching job I want to perform that newspaper tear trick so she bought me the book that explained how to do the newspaper tear and restore magic so I practiced it, and when I got my first head coaching job at Ballinger, I did that trick or magic uh, in front of my first uh, football team. And so I've tried to come up with uh, – I played the guitar, so I played the guitar before at the pep rally, or I'll play it after the game. I'll, I'll make up words that have to do with our football team in season and sing it and uh, – you know, the kids like a coach that does something a little bit different, makes them laugh, makes them smile. I'll try to tell some corny jokes after practice and just do some things to mix it up, make it enjoyable. I, I once heard a coach say that, you know, the thing that we all fight is boredom, you know, because we do a lot of repetitions of the same thing. So I'm always trying to keep things, uh, changing up things and keeping it light and humorous. And uh, when the guys are laughing and having fun, we're usually playing pretty good. And so also then that goes into team meetings. You're known for different outfits, costumes, hats, some different things just to, again, to keep things a little bit lively in team meetings. Well, during the open day, uh, I got a company that has these blow up uh, big slides and uh, slipping slides. I mean, you can rent them. And so when our players came out of school on a I guess it was a Thursday of the open date. I had uh, the company put on the football field these huge blow-up slides and uh, these slipping slides so that when our guys came out, they they were laughing and looking at the slides. And I had to, they went and put their shorts on and came out and uh, just had a great time playing. And then we had popsicles for them afterwards. And then one year I did a skit, the Dilly Dilly skit, which was uh, we don't, you know, we don't, we <laughs> – our extracurricular code of conduct is we don't drink alcohol or get alcohol related tickets, but this was a, we kind of did a uh, takeoff on the dilly dilly skit. So uh, each game we played, I would have the opposing team's mascot. I would order a costume that, of the opposing team. So if it was uh, the bulldogs, I'd order a bulldog, maybe a mask or something. And I had one of our coaches that would put it on and, uh, I don't know if you remember that Dilly Dilly commercial, yeah. but we would make a grand entrance and I would be the king. And then I had the defensive and offensive coordinator on either side of me. And they, I had a crown on and a robe and <laughs> they dressed the part. And I had an executioner, a uh, guy with a guillotine, you know, and he was the bad guy. And uh, so this uh, guy representing our opponents would come into the meeting room with our players seated and he would have a, a Gatorade, the color of our opponent's jerseys, and he would say he's got this great potion or something, and uh, I would sentence him to the 
whatever, whatever it was, the, 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 uh, I can't remember now what it was, but sent us him to doom, uh, to the dungeon or something. Yeah. And then the guy dressed up like a executioner would take him outside the door and our guys would be screaming, hollering. And they were just having fun. I, and I, I think our coaches look forward to it. We had a, we, I, I probably spent four or $500 on costumes that year <laughs> trying to get every, you know, find a costume of all our opponents. But, uh, you know, I mean, that was just something that we did at the end of practice that made it fun for the players. and Coaches and players looked forward to it and laughed and had a good time. Coach, what what was it for you that inspired, I guess, all these kind of interesting and, and fun and different things that you've done over the course of your career? I think probably Lou Holtz had – probably a lot of influence on what I like to do or, you know, some of the innovative things. I, I went to Notre Dame when coach Holtz was coaching there and I watched practice. And of course he was a no nonsense guy. He was a tough guy in practice, but you know, when he do public speaking, he was always fun to listen to, always had great jokes and always did some magic. So I think that influence. And then, uh, I, I just, I just think it's part of, uh, I want our guys to have a good time and to play 16 weeks, you better have some humor. Your guys better be enjoying practice uh, because you won't last if you wear down or wear out or get fatigued or get bored. So I'm always trying to think of things to keep the morale high and uh, make them laugh, have a good time and enjoy it. And uh, Hopefully it'll be a great memory for them. Was that something you did early on in your, in your career as a head coach or is it something you kind of grew into? Oh, I think it's, uh, I think it's something that I started early on, you know, trying to think of things I, uh, that I could do. I, I mean, I think the, I had a, I used to work at Camp County Cook in Branson, Missouri, and I would lead the singing and play the guitar and entertain at that camp. And I think that, that background, uh, gave me some ideas into how to entertain the players and how to have a good time and how to keep it fresh and fun and, uh, you know, I'll tell you this story. I was in Ballinger, and they hadn't been to playoffs in, I don't know, 28 years. We finally got in the playoffs, and I got a knock at my door before the first playoff game, and it was about 7 o'clock at night, and it was a couple. And they said, Coach, we are down at the barbershop today, and we heard two of your players saying they hoped you got beat the first game because they were tired of football. And we're writing a letter to the editor about how disappointed we are. And I said, listen, don't send that letter to the editor. I said, I, those players have given me no indication that they're tired of football. And it would really disturb our team if you did that. So let me talk to them. Let me go to practice when I talk to them. So the next day I go to practice. and I said, guys, playoffs are a reward for a great season. And we're never going to go out in full pads for the rest of the playoffs. This is a reward. You ought to enjoy it. So we're going out in half pads from now on. And, uh, so we did, we had success and we played well. And, and so, a couple, you know, go forward about three years and we're playing the number one team in the state in the playoffs and our players and our captains came up to me and said, coach, can we go out in full pads today or this week? You know, we want to make sure we're ready. I said, guys, we won in half pads and, and, and we played well against some of the best teams. And I said, we're not going to change what we're doing. We've done it well and we're going to keep doing it. So. Uh, you know, you, it's just you got to figure out some ways to keep them excited about it. And uh, football is hard work, and you got to find ways to make f- hard work fun, and so they enjoy the game and keep getting better. Coach, I think you'll agree a, a, a big part of any team success, especially uh, sustained success, is that uh, there's good guys alongside you. Your, your coaching staff is an important part of that. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how you develop a coaching staff and, and, you know, recruit coaches to be a part of your staff. Just like uh, you and I met at the AMCA convention, I think you network as a head coach and as you network, you meet people and you, you're drawn to people and people are drawn to you that have a similar philosophy. So, you know, I'll go to coaches outreach conference. I'll go to an FCA conference uh, I'll go to AFCA, I'll go to the Texas Coach Association uh, Convention. And, I'm, you know, you're just looking to network and, and learn uh, and meet people who have a similar philosophy. 
and I've always talk, talked to young assistant coaches that when you first get in, you know, your first job, you need to tie on to a guy that's going somewhere that has your philosophy, you know, has a philosophy you can agree with. Uh, and so, uh, that is, that philosophy has really worked for me. And the other thing that's worked, especially lately is moving up guys. Uh, I, for a long time, if I had an opening on the varsity, you know, I thought I had to go outside the staff and find somebody on another staff that had a talent and had coached that position and had experience. But, uh, I guess over the last five years, maybe more than that, I've started moving up younger guys. You know, I try to develop young coaches. And so, you know, if I have a good middle school coach, I'll move him up to the freshman level. If I have a good freshman coach, I'll try to move him up to the varsity when I have an opening. If I have a good position coach on the varsity, I'll try to move him to coordinator if I have a coordinator at least. And so, you know, I have maybe a two co-coordinators so that if one leaves, I've got one ready. And that seems to have really worked. It really works well for loyalty and continuity. And uh, as far as getting to know the players, and it also motivates your young coaches to do a good job because they know that I'll recognize it and reward them for it. Coach, when when you get some of those younger guys who, you know, have bigger aspirations, maybe want to be a head coach themselves, and you've talked about the mentorship side of it, uh, how have you, I guess, been able to help them to understand when the right time or when the right opportunity is? For me, I had a goal to be a head coach when I was 30. And uh, so it worked out in my career. But I had to go down, uh, you know, I was at a 6A school. I had to go down to 3A school to get it. And it was a team that hadn't won very much or I wouldn't have gotten the job. Uh, but I try to talk to our guys about setting personal goals in their career. And then, uh, you know, I think about Highland Park is when you get that on your resume, that, that speaks a lot of, that speaks a lot to people that are, uh, evaluate coaches. And, uh, so two things that, that I'll do for them is, you know, I'll try to, I'll try to encourage them and try to mentor them. And then I'll try to, uh, help them with their resumes and, and how to interview. Sometimes I'll just give them the questions that I was asked when I interviewed and give them an idea about preparing a notebook and giving it to all the interview committee before you are, you're actually interviewed. Uh, but it, you know, it's who, you know, not so much what you know. And I always talk to them about the importance of networking because, uh, I just had a defense coordinator get a head job and, and he got it because he knew the athletic director and superintendent who had played for his dad, who was also a coach. And he came back and he had interviewed for a couple of years and hadn't got a head job. And he said, coach, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that's how you get these head jobs. And, uh, so, you know, it's just, uh, t- talking to him about meeting people and, and, uh, how to interview and then, uh, uh, you know, it's one thing to get a job. It's another thing to do it, uh, to do the job. So what, what I like to think is they're going to take the same things we're doing at Highland Park. It's almost like a disciple. He's going to go out and he's going to bless those, uh, that other football team when he gets that head job with, uh, loving them and, and creating the right value system to where they develop character and, and enjoy football. So uh, I'm really encouraged, and, and I always uh, brag about our coaches who go from assistants to head coaches and uh, and are successful. But on the other hand, I'll say this, I wouldn't be where I'm at as a head coach if it hadn't been some, some very loyal assistant coaches who have stuck with me over a long period of time and, uh, you know, know what our offense and defense are, know our values and uh, – play a big role and I can delegate a lot of responsibility to them. Coach, you mentioned leadership in your last answer there. What would you say is the most important thing right now, especially, I mean, our world needs leaders more than ever for coaches right now who are looking to, you know, have their own program or get into a position where they're a coordinator and leading a bigger group. I think even, you know, position coaches have to be leaders too, but what advice do you have for, for young coaches or even old coaches right now to provide great leadership during some trying times? 
I think you've got to have trust in your community and your football team, and you got to be fair. And uh, trust takes a long time to build up. And uh, I always felt like if a, if I could build up trust and in, in the people and the parents in this community trusted me and had confidence in me that I could stay for 21, 22, this would be my 22nd year here, which is a long time for a coach to stay somewhere. But uh, I think trust and fairness are two things you've got to have. And then your kids uh, have to think that you really do care for them. And you show that love for them by, if they get injured, going to see them in the hospital. Uh, it's calling them and texting them and being a friend to them and talking to things outside of football. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we have uh, Zoom meetings now that we're, sheltered in place or when we were sheltered in place we'd have zoom meetings and uh, you know it's it's uh it's just important that you uh get that community to trust you so that they they'll let you coach their son and the, and they won't interfere or second guess you and there's a formula that we use here we you know you got to have players that believe in players players that believe in coaches, coaches that believe in coaches, and coaches that believe in players. And then I tell our parents that the fifth and sixth thing you got to have, you got to have parents that believe in coaches and parents that believe in players. You know, your role in your program started in 1999, and uh, I'm sure it's it's evolved. How is, has your role as far as what you do as a, a coach changed or evolved over the years? Well, I – In 99, I came here as the athletic director and the head football coach. And I thought that I could handle that because I'd been an athletic coordinator at a 5A school and been the head football coach, I guess, for 15, uh, 18 years. And so, but I got here and there were so many expectations from the girls' programs and from the, the boys' other sports that I had a very hard time. Uh, with my uh, time schedule in uh, giving the other sports the, the, the attention they needed and then being able to be 100% a football coach for our football team. And, of course, uh, I had an athletic girls coordinator that helped me out a lot with the girls. And then during football season, I wound up being pretty much 100% football and delegated uh uh, to another coach, a uh, head basketball coach, the uh, kind of like an athletic coordinator role. But uh, as I've gotten older, and I, I just want to do the things that I enjoy doing, so uh, I'm able to be the head football coach, and then I've, I'm kind of the coordinator over all the boys' sports, but in particular basketball, baseball, and track are the sports which uh, I attend their events and tend their banquets and it's allowed me to enjoy football and spend the time necessary I need uh, to make sure we've got the best football team we can have and, and enjoy myself and create some margin in my life I just got to a point in coaching where I told my wife I I'm not enjoying it I can't do this anymore I mean I was going to banquets four nights a week or to an athletic event I'd coach all day and then go to an event at night and I'd you know, do it all year. And by the end of the year, I was just worn slick. I was just worn out. And I, I, I just yearned for some margin so I could do things I enjoyed away from football. And I've gotten to the point in my career where the school board, the administration has allowed me to to be a football coach and have the time I need to, to be with our football team and yet uh, also, you know, be a coordinator in four, three other sports that are very important to our program. Coach, within your program, what's your role in in game planning, offense, defense, special teams, uh, and and do you do you call anything on game day? Yes, I call the offense, and I've always uh, coached the quarterbacks. Call the offense, and I, I always tell the coaches that the guy that calls the plays ought to be the quarterback coach because you know the strengths and weaknesses of the quarterback and. Uh, When I first got into coaching, an older, a very experienced coach said that to be successful, you need three things. You need a loving wife, a loyal dog, and a great quarterback, not necessarily in that order. (laughs) So I uh, 
try to develop quarterbacks is what I do. And, uh, I, then I developed the game plan, but I get I do it with help from our staff. I sign, I delegate different parts of the game plan to different position coaches, and the, each coach on offense has a, a formation that they're responsible for breaking down or putting the blitz tendencies on the board, and then recommending plays that they think will work from our menu uh, that week, and then we meet on Sunday afternoon and everybody gets a chance to present and that's what becomes our scouting report. And then we start putting our game plan together, but, uh, I'm in charge of scripting and, and uh, getting the practice plans ready with input from our staff, uh, and then, you know, running the practice and, uh, on game night, I call the plays. I have three signal callers next to me, one, two dummy, one live. And then I have a, two coaches in the press box, an offensive line coach and a wide receiver coach that are hooked up to me so that I, I understand what's going on on the field. I have a, And the other thing I would say about that is I completely <laughs> turn over the defense to the defensive <laughs> coordinator. I don't interfere at all. And uh, also we delegate the special teams. Uh, the offense has the – certain parts of the kicking game and uh, then the defense has more responsibility in the special teams and at this time you know every guy, every guy on the staff has a role to play in special teams and so I do delegate those things and uh, that defensive coordinator and that kicking game coordinator are really important players on our football team as well as our offensive line coach. This is something else I was told when I got into coaching is the two places you can get beat the quickest are the secondary and the offensive line. So you better have your best coaches on the offensive line and the secondary. And that's, that's proven true. Yep. So coach, I've, I've talked to quite a few coordinators on the podcast and, and a lot of guys will talk about, you know, delegating things and breaking them up. This is actually the first time I've, I've heard of somebody delegating that by formation. I think that's uh, that's an interesting concept for me. What, what do you feel are the advantages of looking at and breaking down the game that way and, and delegating it that way? I think uh, it's easier to, you know, when you break down your film, you've got all of a double set and, one guy's got all of the three by one sets and one guy's got two back with three wide sets and the other guy's got an empty set. And so they just study that. That's they, they're supposed to be experts at that. And I've got other things that I'm trying to accomplish on Saturday and Sunday besides just being an expert in every formation. So when we come together at about three o'clock on Sunday afternoon to start our game plan, They've already written all that up on the board. They've already drawn the formations. They've got tendencies, blitz tendencies, hash tendencies. They've got uh, suggestions of plays and who are the strongest players and who are the weakest players at their position that we could attack. And then I, I think it, it, it really means a lot to them. They get up, to, they stand up in front of the whole staff and they, they talk about what they learned and what they think will work and. And uh, then, uh, again, they all of them get a chance to present. The last thing I do is our offensive coordinator, who's our offensive line coach, gets up and he talks about all the fronts we're going to see that week and how we're going to block our running game. And I said, I want, I want you to rank our the best plays from, the, you know, one to five. I want the five best running plays. I want to know what formations you think we should run them out of and, you know, what leverage and angles we ought to take advantage of and, so I get that input, and then as the week goes on, I'll, I'll go back to them. I say, I'm, I'm still confused about this. Explain this coverage to me or explain this front to me. And, uh, it's you know, sometimes I'll go into Thursday, and I'm still cloudy, and I'm asking questions. And, and, uh, and I, so I need those coaches to really – and they do study a whole lot. And I just need them to be experts at it. And by the time – time game time comes you know i have a game plan i have it typed out first down left hash first down middle you know all that second down medium second down sure second down long all the way down to gadgets red zone and all that so i've got it typed out on the paper i hand it out to them and uh so everybody's got a copy of it especially the guys in the press box but one thing that we do that's kind of unique is on uh uh wednesday 
uh, no, it's Thursday. Uh, before we go out on a practice field, I take poker chips and I put them in uh, formation and I take the uh, the color of our opponents and I cut out pictures of each player and I tape it or glue it onto that poker chip so that our quarterbacks and receivers and uh, running backs are on one side of the table. They've got their finger on their poker chip, which represents their position. And they're in a formation, and on the other side, I'm playing defense. So I've got our opponents, and I've got their pitcher, their weight, their height, uh, what classification they are, and I've got them lined up in a in the defense that I think we're going to see against that coverage. And then I call out a play on our our game plan, and they have to take their poker chip and move it to wherever their assignment is. And then I get tell I ask that quarterback to tell me what he sees and what his reads are and what he expects those receivers to do. I started doing that in 2004 when we weren't throwing the ball very well and we weren't synced up between our quarterback and receivers. And it's amazing how much improvement we made in a year when our quarterback got to ex- voice or express what he was looking for against certain coverages. And, and those receivers got to hear his voice about what he expected them to do. So that's really been a plus as far as getting our guys ready for game day and them learning the game plan. I love it. And I've heard uh, of coaches, I've never used them myself, but I, I've heard and I've seen coaches use the poker chips before. But the uh, the player information and pictures on the poker chip, that that's to uh, – another level how do you feel giving them that kind of detail helps them further with the game plan i think the more they can visualize what the game before it happens somebody said you got to play the game before the game and as as much as you can rep those guys on what they're going to see and who they're going to be playing against i think the better they'll perform i've always tried to tell our guys your subconscious can't tell the difference in what's imagined and what's real and so you got to visualize yourself making great plays. Visualize yourself against the guy you're going to play against. The more you know about him, the better prepared you're going to be. And and then when the game gets here, then you're going to be freed up to make those plays. And uh, so that's kind of how we've worked to get our guys mentally ready to play. So, Coach, stepping back to the game planning process, you know, we talked a lot about the formations and, and the blocking schemes, et cetera. Uh, how do you guys account for, what do you look for as far as uh, situational football, especially things like third down, red zone? Well, we try to <laughs> we try to put, you know, uh, find out what our quarterback can do best and then find out who your best football players are and think players, not plays. I got into trouble calling plays when I'm thinking about outsmarting the other team instead of thinking about, who is our best player and who do we want to get the ball to and how many touches do we want him to have? And so uh, I think it's, uh, I think you got to have a few new wrinkles every once in a while. And then we'll, uh, for third down or short yardage, you know, we'll go to a uh, quick huddle and we'll put different personnel in the game. So we may be unbalanced, but we'll put bigger personnel in the game and if our quarterback's a runner, we'll we'll be you know wildcat formation. We'll try to get lined up and uh, before you can get lined up and catch you off balance. Uh, but I I do think you know you got to know. Uh, I think you got to have a plan for short yardage and you got to have a plan for red zone and uh, you know people that play man or people that play zone on the goal line that's huge as far as your passing game and you just got to have plays for each one of them and. You know, there are a couple of ways to do it. One is use a dummy snap count, and that allows me to look and see what they're doing. Uh, you don't have a play call. You just go through your snap count. If they jump in the noops zone, you snap it, run uh, verticals on the outside. But uh, I think you got to have a plan, and then I think you have to be flexible enough to adjust during the game if you're not getting exactly what you thought you were going to get. But I do think you need to show some different things each week formation wise and, and unbalanced and uh, maybe tempo wise. And uh, this year we're going to have to trade every film in the past. We've only had to trade three films, but the, our UIL, which is our 
governing body said you got to trade every film this year. So my thinking going into this year is I got to show a different formation every game, different movement, different tempo, uh, something to make people really have to prepare for a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Now, for you, being able to get 10 games – how will you guys treat that? Are you still going to just break down three or are, are you going to look at everything? You know, what are your thoughts there? Well, you picked the, for me, I can't look at 10. So I got to look at three of uh, games that our opponents play similar offenses, but you do have to have somebody that looks at all 10 of them to pick out all the gadget plays or, pick up some unique things that they might do so you don't get surprised. So I think for me, I'm going to pick out the three games that have to do with teams that play our type of uh, spread shotgun offense. And I do think it's possible that you could uh, edit out all of the formations that you run against, uh, you know, against the teams that they play. That's just a lot of stuff to look at. And sometimes you don't have time, but to look at three. Mm -hmm. So coach 39 years and things change a lot over the years. Some of them come back maybe in different ways, but for you, how have you stayed on top of the game and how do you continue to learn this game? (laughs) Well, there's there's only one way. Well, there's there's lots of ways, but you study. So I I order books and order videos and I study. I look at YouTube. Uh, uh, I subscribe to different football websites where guys are diagramming plays and going over uh, offense that fits our system. Uh, But I think you got to change about 10%, 15% of your offense each year. Uh, And so I'm always looking for things that I think fit our personnel because in high school, your personnel are a little bit different each year. So you got to, you know, this year we got three tight ends that I really have a lot of confidence in. Well, we've always been four wides or three wides. And so this year I'm looking at how can you use three tight ends. So I'm looking at a lot more pro uh, teams uh, because they use a lot more tight ends and some college teams that use tight ends because, you know, if, if people in our, in Dallas, they're used to shotgun spread teams. And you go to, Three tight ends, it's something they don't see very often. And a lot of times you can uh, uh, you can really have some success uh, when they don't know how to line up against something or they haven't practiced it as much. With, um, I hope that Dallas coaches don't listen to this podcast, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at 15%, right? And let's say you you change that. How are you able to keep that fluid in your, your teaching? Well... We've had three, I mean, two really great quarterbacks. Uh, John Stephen Jones, who was a playmaker, and uh, he could turn a bad play into good play, like to scramble. Uh, he was not extremely fast, but uh, he threw a very adequate football, but uh, he, he was just a guy that was accurate. He was a playmaker, and he could make a play with his feet when he had to. Uh, after him, we had Chandler, uh, John Stephen went to Arkansas scholarship. Then John, uh, Chandler Morris came along. He runs a four five forty, also an excellent thrower, got a lot of velocity on the ball. So each one of those quarterbacks was different, so the offense looked a little bit different. This year, I'm going to have a guy that's not as good a runner, but he's, he's an outstanding thrower. So I'm going to be more interested in the RPO game, and I've got to figure out a way that that we can still have an explosive offense and not depend on our quarterback to run the ball as often. And uh, uh, so, you know, I mean, I think, again, it goes back to players and figuring out what your quarterback can do the best. Stepping back to something a little bit earlier, we were talking about coaching staff. Uh, I, I didn't get to follow up with this question at the time, but it's I think it's pretty important. Uh, for you, as far as the coaching staff, uh, probably a big part of the – the loyalty is is uh, you're you're great to those guys, and you really emphasize family first. That it's important to you that these guys are there for all the things they need to be as a father. 
Right. And uh, we hope that no coach puts football ahead of his family. So I'm very understanding when a coach comes to me and says, Coach, you know, it's my son's birthday. I need to go home early today. Or, Coach, my daughter's playing soccer this afternoon. Can I get my work done so I can go watch her play on the weekend? Or Those are things that I think you, you've got to be sensitive to and flexible to. Uh, I'm always trying to be efficient on the weekends because I know how teaching our guys have to prepare lesson plans and they work their tails off during the week. So I'm always trying to be efficient on the weekend and not hold them up there just to be work working, but get our work done in a hurry so they can get home to be with their families. We try to have a get together before the beginning of the year. And, and sometimes we entitle it goodbye dear footballs here because we know we're going to spend a lot of time up at the field house during football season. And we want our wives and children to feel part of the family and we don't know how much we appreciate them. Uh, my wife wrote a book called The Coach's Wife, and it was after we had gone to the Fellowship of Christian Athlete Marriage and Richmond Weekend Conference that we heard my wife told me, she said, man, the women in my huddle, they were just griping about how much time their husbands were spending at work and how they didn't like being a coach's wife. And I said, well, honey, wouldn't it be great if, if a young lady was dating a coach and that she'd have something to read to know what the coaching life was going to be like. And uh, so anyway, she wrote this book and uh, she's had a lot of good feedback. And what it, what a coach's wife has to understand is the coaching is a ministry. You know, you call the coach like a preacher's called to preach. And if your wife is a part of that ministry and feels like that's your, that, that's your calling, she's much more, uh, willing to allow you to spend the time it takes to be a successful coach. If the if the wife's not willing to let you spend the time to be a successful coach, there's a good chance that you won't be successful. And your marriage is more important than your coaching career. And so you've got to make sure that in the off season when you're not spending 18 or 12 to 18 hours a day uh, coaching that you can be at home with her and, and uh, show her attention. You know, the, the times in our marriage when I had the most problems right after football season, I'd usually be disappointed because we lost our last game of the playoffs and I was tired. And my wife had been doing all the work at home and she expected me to come home from football early and, and start doing things around the house. And I was still moping around trying to get over the season. And one day she said, Ray, I'm so t- I'm so tired of you being selfish. She said, "I hate to say it, but you're just being so selfish." And uh, I went to a Fellowship of Christian Athlete conference, and the speaker said that you ought to give your wife the first 15 minutes when you come in the door, your undivided attention. So don't read the newspaper, or sit the lounger in the lounger in front of your TV set, but go in and ask her how her day went, and listen to her, look in her eyes, and give her your attention. And uh, that's 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 been some really good advice. Yeah, that's great advice, uh, Coach. You mentioned that you guys are doing zooms now. Uh, probably what three four months ago, a lot of us uh, didn't know what Zoom was, and now everybody's proficient in, in it. Do you see Zoom being something you guys might use as coaches, maybe to uh, maybe get out of the field house a little bit more? Well, our school district used Google for some reason. We and uh, but yes, I do see the advantage of doing things on Google now. Uh, I talked to our quarterbacks. Now that we can work out, this will be our third week to start working out for strength and conditioning in the summer. So I talked to them about whether they wanted to continue our Google meetings or whether they wanted to do meetings at the field house on a whiteboard. And uh, they said, Coach, we won't do it at the whiteboard. Too many of our guys are not paying attention. They, mm-hmm. they they take their camera off and not pay attention when you're talking on Google. So we want you to do it in person. And uh, so even though Google is a great way to present information, if you don't have their attention and they're not paying attention, uh, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. Right. Well, Coach, as, as we finish up here, the question I always like to ask, and it's one I just – borrowed from a title of a Bill Walsh book, uh, Finding the Winning Edge. When when you look at everything you do as a coach, what would be 
the main thing or the one thing you could point to that gives your team the winning edge? Well, at our place, it's uh, probably belief in, in the tradition. Uh, we're the winningest high school football team in the history of Texas high school football, and we talk to our guys about leave it better than you found it. So, And we talk to them about tradition ever graduate so that when they come up through our program, they're going to hear that all the time. They're going to hear that if you outwork your opponents, you have a chance to be successful. We may not be the most talented football team, but we're going to work harder and we're going to play harder than our opponents. And we're always going to go on the field thinking we're going to win. So I think the winning edge is your thought process and the values and the confidence you build in your kids as they grow up through your program. Coach, for our listeners out there, if if they wanted to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Oh, I have a uh, a website, Coach Randy Allen, and uh, that's probably the best way. I've got a, I've written a couple of books. Uh, one called uh, Coaching by the Book, and the other one is uh, Coaching to Build Character. And uh, they can get on that website and uh, order those books or communicate. Coach, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been a thrill to talk to you here on the podcast, and best of luck to you and your team in 2020. Thank you, Keith.